Hello again, and welcome back to the Slow Flowers Podcast with Deborah Prinzing, episode 548. This is the weekly podcast about slow flowers and the people who grow and design with them. It's all about making a conscious choice, and I invite you to join the conversation and the creative community as we discuss the vital topics of saving our domestic flower farms and supporting a floral industry that relies on a safe, seasonal, and local supply of flowers and foliage. This show is brought to you by slowflowers.com, the free online directory to more than 880 florists, shops, and studios who design with local, seasonal, and sustainable flowers, and to the farms that grow those blooms. It's the conscious choice for buying and sending flowers. And thank you to our lead sponsor, returning for 2022, Farm Girl Flowers. Farm Girl Flowers delivers iconic burlap wrap bouquets and lush, abundant arrangements to customers across the U.S., supporting U.S. flower farms by purchasing more than $10 million of U.S. grown, fresh and seasonal flowers and foliage annually. Discover more at farmgirlflowers.com. Our next sponsor thanks goes to flowerfarm.com, a leading wholesale flower distributor that sources from carefully selected flower farms to offer high-performing fresh flowers sent directly from the farm straight to you. You can shop by flower and by country of origin at flowerfarm.com. Find flowers and foliage from California, Florida, Oregon, and Washington by using the origin selection tool in your search. Learn more at flowerfarm.com. In mid-January, I was invited to a virtual launch of an ambitious new consumer-focused flower promotion brand called That Flower Feeling. The invitation came from Cal Flowers, the floral trade association most widely known for providing its members with the lowest FedEx shipping discounts and negotiated discounts through other ground and air channels across the U.S. One of the association's top goals is to promote the benefits of flowers to new generations of American consumers. Slow Flower Society is a member of Cal Flowers, and we're grateful for Cal Flowers' sponsorship of the upcoming Slow Flowers Summit. I was so impressed about the brand That Flower Feeling and the new campaign, Flowers Self-Care Made Easy, that I wanted to share it with our Slow Flowers community. The campaign is a cooperative effort to get more Americans enjoying more flowers more often. My guest, Steve Dion, Executive Director of Cal Flowers, believes that whether it's from upscale florists, farmers markets, or grocery stores, as long as people regularly bring home flowers, it's a good thing. Let's jump right in and meet Steve, hear about Cal Flowers, and how that flower feeling was created. And you'll be able to view some of the fun assets and content they've created, all available to you for your own marketing efforts if you come check it out at our slowflowerspodcast.com show notes, episode 548. Let's get started. Well, hello, everybody. Welcome back to the Slow Flowers Show with Deborah Prinzing. And I've got a very special guest today. I want to welcome Steve Dion, Executive Director of Cal Flowers. Hi, Steve. Hi, Deborah. Uh, thanks so much for having me on today. I really appreciate it. Oh, and this has been long in coming, and I'm so grateful for our partnership with Slow Flowers and Cal Flowers. Uh, we started last year with the Slow Flowers Summit, right. and that was awesome. And you're coming back, you've come back for 2022, and you're also supporting the podcast. And that's not why I'm having you on. This is news, people. We're not doing a <laughs> Pay to play here. I want to share what Cal Flowers is doing. But first, Steve, can you just give us a snapshot of what Cal Flowers is? Because it's kind of a funny name. It implies that you're only California focused. And I know that's not the truth. You're absolutely right about that. Um, <clears throat> Cal Flowers was originally called the Northern California Association of Flower Growers and Shippers. And it was formed in 1941. So we're actually in our 81st wow. year now. And it was formed by a group of friendly uh, flower farmers in Northern California that wanted to find more efficient ways to get their product to market, mainly to get it up to the San Francisco and San Jose airports in a more efficient manner. And that's kind of where it all started. But since that time, there's been tremendous change uh, inside the association. And we are a full national uh, organization now. We have members in all 50 states. Uh, we currently have just under 900 members. And we represent virtually every industry segment. We have uh, everything from breeders to retail florists, uh, transporters, wholesalers, importers, uh, obviously domestic farmers, 
um, we've kind of hit the full range. Um, and a lot of our members, you know, are, are very involved with Slow Flowers and we're very, very proud of our association with Slow Flowers. And it's a great example of how we, uh, how our, the board of directors chooses to support the industry. Mm -hmm. um, we're very, very generalized in our approach to the industry. We want, we kind of believe that a rising tide lifts all boats. And that ties back into our aspirational theme, which is more Americans enjoy more flowers more often. And we feel real strongly about that. And uh, we, we choose to stay out of the kind of domestic versus import or, you know, local versus California grown. All those are not relevant to our, our mission. Um, we just want to see more Americans enjoy more flowers more often. Um, and the last thing I want to mention is Cal Flowers is really well known for our Fun and Sun Convention, which is an every other year event. Um, this year, it's the last week in August. And it's the Hotel Del Coronado in San Diego, which is an absolute gem of a property, um, very iconic West Coast property. And uh, we think it's going to be a fantastic convention this year. And it'll be themed around that flower feeling, um, the brand that we've created uh, that you and I will be talking about today. Yeah, I'm hoping to come. It's on my calendar. I was actually just talking to someone from Kansas City earlier this week, one of our members who said, I've got it on my calendar. So uh, right. I think I think after we've all experienced this sort of pent up uh, desire to connect in person. And so um, it's great that, I mean, it's great that I can go forward with the Slow Flowers Summit. It's great that Cal Flowers can have fun and sun uh, because it's been a while. You had to, did you reschedule? It's been too long. We did. We had to reschedule. We thought we were on track, but the Dell, um, it would just went through a major uh, refurbishment of the entire property. And because of the supply chain issues uh, due to COVID, they just simply didn't have our space ready for us in time last summer. Yeah. So we moved it forward by a year and we're on track to, to roll with it. Yeah. Things happen for a reason. Well, I wanted to uh, just comment back on your origins. You know, it is it is so interesting that the origins of Cal Flowers is farmers coming together to try and get flowers to the end consumer. That really right. hasn't changed that much. It's just that, as you said, you're broader and you have more people under the tent now. Um, but it's your, you once were described to me as a transportation organization, but that's sort of a single faceted, right? That used much, to be yeah. the majority of our mission was based around transportation. Um, that eventually led to uh, what we now have, which is an evergreen FedEx contract. And our FedEx contract is, you know, by far and away the, the best in the industry that's that's uh, widely available. Um, most anybody listening to this, uh, this podcast who's involved in the floral industry um, is eligible to become a Cal Flowers member. And by doing so, you receive it. I think the current discount level is around 72% off list rates. And so it's really, really significant. And uh, it's, I feel that it's, for a lot of companies, it's changed their approach to fresh flower distribution. It's opened up a lot of new channels. Um, we also work very closely with refrigerated trucking companies, um, you know, mainly on inside California organization, you know, movement towards the docks and cutoff times and things like that. Um, and we also have uh, some fantastic airline contracts as well. So if you use the proper commodity codes, you can receive uh, amazing discounts across numerous different airlines. And then we I also have a that. GLS program. I see so. that um, in your newsletter. I see something about Alaska Airlines or something about Southwest. I didn't quite understand that. So can we unpack that a little bit? But basically, let's talk about the FedEx um, camp uh, opportunity and then maybe a few of these other things. Sure. Um, the FedEx, I saw interest among small flower farmers explode in shipping, interest in shipping explode because during COVID, especially when people couldn't sell face to face and they had right. to try to figure out how to move their product. Cal Flores was a solution then, even for small, a, a, say a one or two acre farm. Our most significant membership growth is in that category uh, over oh. the last, I would say 18 months. I don't have a specific number uh, for you, but um, of all the applications that come across uh, my desk, we see a very high percentage of small domestic flower farmers. So our yeah. program has turned out to be very, very beneficial. And I think it's causing people to kind of rethink and retool their approach to the market and how far they can reach with the product that they grow and that sort of thing. So um, it's it's really a fantastic uh, way to get into shipping. Um, very, very low cost and low barrier to entry. Um, and we also encourage people to look at things like the kind of the one day ground footprint, um, which is how the, the really large online sellers uh, keep their costs low. Um, and, and for 
whether you're a retail florist or a small farm or a large farm or whatever, um, it, it provides you overnight service at ground rates in a fairly large geographic area. And we, we definitely encourage people to, to look at that as a potential business channel. Is that also through FedEx? Yes, through FedEx. FedEx okay. Ground. So it's more like within a particular zone because FedEx cuts the country up into zones. So like they, a they can give you a map based on mm-hmm. your zip code, how far you can reach with the one day ground footprint. Wow. Um, that's kind of how it works. So um, I would encourage anybody to contact yeah. FedEx and determine what their what their geographic zone is. Uh, the denser the area you're in, the larger the zone is, which you know kind of makes sense from a logistics standpoint. Yeah. But uh, yeah, that's... Um, it's kind of a key part. It's not as deeply discounted because the rates are so incredibly low to begin with on ground um, versus the express transportation. But it's a perishable product. So if you just want to start with the pebble in the pond approach and just distribute in your geographic region, you know, maybe a couple hundred miles, you're still reaching a lot of consumers. Absolutely. Who you couldn't physically deliver to. So can you, I, I will put all the information about joining Cowflowers on our show notes uh, at slowflowerspodcast.com for episode four. 548 that'll appear next week but um can you give me some ballparks like what would a small farm pay to join and how how would people i mean i i'm sure it pays for itself if you're selling flowers it does it, it, the um the membership fee is 395 dollars, and if you ship if you're express shipping on fedex by the time you ship your six or seventh box of the year you've already basically paid for your your membership in cow flowers so for anybody who ships uh, with any sort of regularity on FedEx, it's pretty much a no-brainer from an economic standpoint. It's a definite cost savings. Oh, my gosh. Yeah. And I think there's a little more confidence now that more small farms are doing it. People are seeing their peers offer maybe a particular, only a particular crop, like just ranunculus or a mixed uh, selection. And they're just, you just have to start. And then... Exactly. Yeah, I, <laughs> I, your I, like your, I, I like your pebble in the pond analogy. I think that's a the right way to look at it. Yeah, don't take on the whole North American continent right now. Just start with your market and see how how you can build. I, I think that's great. Um, you mentioned these airlines, and I I'm thinking I understand that like in Seattle we're close to Alaska, so if we could ship flowers from a, a Pacific Northwest farm via Alaska to a destination that Alaska flies to, is that kind of what you're talking about? Um. Yeah, so basically that we pre-negotiate uh, perishable rates um, with various different airlines. Um, so this gets you, you know, quite far below their list rates. Um, it, each contract is different. So, uh, for example, um, if it's JetBlue, then their their rates are restricted to certain origin airports. That they're it, kind of when we go into the negotiations, the idea is to say. Uh, what freight lanes are you trying to capitalize on? What are you trying to build volume on? Mm. And so um, the, many of them are California origin, but some of them apply to other origin airports as well. Um, and so once we, uh, once you become a Calflowers member, you receive the commodity rate code that you put on the airway bill and that automatically triggers the, the freight discounts. Okay, great. And then I cut you off. You were talking about GLS. I don't know what that is. Ground something? Uh, uh, GLS is uh, another express service, but it's restricted to the Western states. But it's our fastest growing um, transportation channel. Um, we've seen massive year-over-year growth in the 30 to 40 percent range, um, and it's basically just a door-to-door uh, express service. Um, and I, I want to say it's seven Western states. Um, okay. The, you know, kind of all the the ones that hug the left coast, and yeah. uh, so anybody in that region can really benefit from the GLS program. It's, it's still air freight. It's not trucking, or is it a combination? It's it's up to GLS how they move the product, oh, but the majority okay. is ground transportation. Oh wow, that's cool. I mean, obviously, all of this I want to just acknowledge it's all a carbon footprint, it's all a transportation footprint, but we're supporting flower farmers trying to sell their product, and so you know it's like uh, people can't scale and can't have a sustainable living on their farm if they can't sell their product. It's sort of my exactly. the way I've rationalized this to my in my own mind. And that's why we've seen so much growth in that segment is there's just a ton of uh, flower farmers that um, recognize the need to reduce the transportation cost. It puts them on the same footing as some of the big boys that are out there um, in terms of uh, cost, you know, competitive factors. Um, and it really expands their their reason and, and who they can sell to. And that's that's always a good thing. That's really egalitarian. I mean, that's I hadn't thought about that. But the the largest farms are basically getting the same. The smaller farms are getting the same rate as the larger farms. 
Exactly. Uh, I, wow. I mean, if you have a flower farm that's doing 80 to a hundred million dollars a year um, in total revenue versus one that's doing maybe a quarter of a million in revenue, they get exactly the same rate. Wow. Or someone who's doing a hundred thousand. Yeah. Wow. At, at any level. Okay. That's a snapshot of cow flowers. There's lots more, uh, just dive into the resources that I'll provide in terms of links and the staff is amazing. They can answer any questions. If you really, uh, I'm sure you've fielded a lot of phone calls about how <laughs> same questions I've just asked you, but you did something monumental. I I'd heard about it through the grapevine. I heard about it from you and from some of your board members. And in early part of 2022 in January, you unveiled, I don't even know what to call it, a flower lovers promotion campaign that is penetrating all media in North America or in the U.S. rather. Um, and I want to hear about it. And I want to show some clips. So um, okay. tell, can I say what it's called? Yeah, absolutely. Go okay, for it. you mentioned it earlier. That flower feeling uh, is That's sort right. of the, the broader campaign. And within that, there's all kinds of incredibly uh, engaging, entertaining, really creative ways to get people to think about buying flowers. So uh, I'm just going to let you tell the story. I want to hear the backstory and I want to hear the front story and we'll show some clips and tell people how they can uh, participate. Okay, great. So I'll start by just kind of describing the campaign that we rolled out and I'll go back and kind of explain how we conceived of it and how we got where we are today. So um, what we did is we, the, we created a brand called That Flower Feeling and the brand is designed to endure through numerous campaigns moving into the future. So it, it has its own website um, with some good information on it and links to, so that consumers who engage with that flower feeling are able to watch the videos and you know receive some initial kind of frontline education about flowers. Um, the campaign itself that we rolled out is called Flowers Self-Care Made Easy. And it was specifically uh, during the creative process uh, we identified, so we looked, we had two pieces of information to look at. Cow Flowers, about four or five years ago, did a very um, thorough, it was called a semiotic uh, market analysis. And it was a deep dive into the culture around flowers in the United States, the demographics around flowers, and really trying to paint this broad cultural picture and then decide based on that what sort of activations might be effective. And the firm that we used for that is the same firm, for example, that um, did the Got Milk campaign or, or okay. kind of originated the Got Milk campaign. So they have a really high track record of success um, of kind of finding this these little uh, cultural niches that you can slide into and really create a very effective marketing message. So we had that in our back pocket for a couple of years and weren't exactly quite sure what to do with it. Meantime, uh, we had some eyes on the mainland Europe market and a campaign that they'd launched called We Need More Flowers. And mm. if anybody has not seen We Need More Flowers, it is simply outstanding. Until we kind of launched our own campaign, I, I thought it was the best thing I've ever seen in terms of marketing and, and promoting um, the enjoyment of cut flowers. It's really, really outstanding. Very emotional, very colorful, a lot of movements. It's fun. It's edgy. And so that helped kind of frame our approach. And as we were going... so. Then COVID hit, right? So all of a sudden, just like everybody, just the world changed, everything changed. And that happened in March, 2020, seemed to be, you know, when things locked down and that sort of thing. But then you fast forward into kind of the July, August period. And all of a sudden, myself and everybody in the industry that I was talking to was looking around saying, what happened with demand? Why did demand just magnify so immediately and significantly in such an obvious way. I mean, it was obvious to everybody. Yeah, it, it wasn't just Mother's Day. It was the whole year, right? It just was like a train coming down the tracks and it yeah. hasn't stopped. It's still maintaining that that forward momentum. And so the Cal Flowers Board of Directors um, basically took a step back and said, we recognize there's been a sea change in, in consumer demand for fresh flowers. And we had our own market analysis. And then uh, we, there was a similar one that was done in Europe that had almost precisely the same results in terms of the demographics and, and why people enjoy cut flowers and things like that. The main difference being Europe already had higher consumption because it's more baked into their everyday culture. Yeah. And so that was a, a really important point that we latched onto is how do we make, how do we help encourage consumers to recategorize flowers in their mind to be an everyday or a weekly routine um, and how do we kind of cement that concept? And so 
when we looked at all the effects of COVID and just through conversations around the industry, it was obvious, um, especially if you talk to retail florists, it was obvious that th th there was a new category of consumer that was engaging with our industry. And that was people that were buying flowers for themselves. So it's moving out of that kind of gift and the special event, wedding, funeral, all that kind of category that it's always been so entrenched in. And all of a sudden people were buying them from this, for themselves and they wanted them on their Instagram feed and they wanted them um, in their kind of on screen during their Zoom calls. And they wanted to beautify their home because people had been home for a long time at that point. And <laughs> yeah, and we're watching cable news and every pundit has got flowers in their living room when they're on Zoom with like the network or, you know, the host. Like it, exactly. it, was, it was permeating uh, yeah, every so vision we had. So there's this wave that was crashing. And so the, the board of directors of Cal Flowers um, basically decided Look, from a marketing standpoint, we no longer have to create a wave. We just have to, to ride it. And so we um, engaged with a company called 180 Amsterdam. And that's the same marketing firm that created the We Need More Flowers campaign with the Flower Council of Holland. So we knew we were getting a known quantity with a proven track record of success and an understanding of the fresh cut flower market, at least on the European side. Um, yeah. And they had uh, you know, kind of demonstrated with some uh, market analytics how effective their campaign had been. Um, they um, have demonstrated that they created a 300 million euro expansion in fresh cut flower purchases over the two years that the that they ran that campaign. Um, and that was in France, Germany, Netherlands and UK. Just those four wow. countries is where they did wow. it. And so Easy. that's 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 major. It was about 100 X return on investment on the that's marketing crazy. dollars that were spent on it. So um, we made the decision uh, the board of directors made the decision, the biggest decision in the history of cow flowers to allocate the necessary financial resources to try and replicate the success of that campaign for the United States market. And so um, what we, we then entered the kind of the creative process. So uh, what that entailed was trying to identify where do we want to hit the market? What are the kind of uh, the demographics? And we had these good, you know, um, research studies to, to give us kind of inform our decision in that regard. Um, but then what category do we want to be into? What's the messaging that we want to do? And ultimately, um, this was very COVID influenced. It was self care. That's the space. It was a. It's still just an absolute burgeoning industry. It's all over the cultural zeitgeist. Um, it's all over TikTok, all over Instagram. Um, the whole self care movement is major, um, especially with our younger generation, uh, especially among women. And mm -hmm. we felt that if we could move fresh cut flowers into that space, which it's it's not a it's it's a space that just kind of has this random conglomeration of things ranging from yoga to breathing to meditation to you know candles and everything in between it's, and it's so, all that that wellness and mindfulness kind of space that you're right it, there's a lot of ways to e express it and yes. why weren't flowers in that in that universe and what we know from you know years and years of scientific studies is flowers absolutely belong in that space as perhaps one of the primary occupiers of that space. And so we thought that the job before us was to move, to, to do whatever we could to influence consumers to recategorize flowers into the self-care space. And we knew we wanted it to be very appealing to the younger generation. So we set out to make it funny and edgy and irreverent and very shareable in, in terms of like kind of the social media environment. And we think that we accomplished that. Um, we, uh, as we went through the creative process, it started with coming up with the concepts and then eventually moved quite quickly towards, okay, now it's time to actually produce something. So we had to go through a big director search and we were very selective about the director that we brought on board. Then we had to find an actress uh, to be kind of what we call the hero actress, the main actress for the filming that we were going to do. And we got all that kind of uh, put together. And then we did production October through December. In the meantime, we were working with uh, a firm in Los Angeles called The Designery. Um, they're a digital media firm. And so they were putting together a digital strategy for us, um, you know, recognizing that we did have budget constraints, but we had a, we knew we could make a strong play in the market. And eventually we settled on a digital media strategy with them that will give us roughly 55 million social media engagements. Plus on top of that, a uh, tremendous reach through hired uh, paid influencers and then on top of that, a bunch more reach through some of the world's most popular podcasts. And mm -hmm. so um, that the first stage of the campaign was strictly social media. And that was launched in the middle of January. We ran it for two weeks and then we 
paused everything to get through the Valentine's Day period because there's so much noise in the market. And so many companies are doing their own, you know, individual advertising efforts. And we didn't want to interfere with what was going on with an already successful, you know, effort for Valentine's Day. And it, right. through the industry, I will say that the, all reports for Valentine's Day was absolutely epic this year. Really, really strong, which is good. Good for all of us. Um, absolutely. But, That's great. But now this week, we've relaunched the second stage of the campaign. It runs through April 4th. And now it's not just the social, it's also the influencers are, are going live. So just today, as a matter of fact, sometime in the next few hours, five influencers in different parts of the country are going to receive flowers and go through the process of opening the box, describing how it makes them feel, arranging the flowers, talking a little bit about care and handling. And each one, like one mainly focuses on wellness and yoga. Uh, one of them is this really cool um group called uh, Black Men with Gardens. And they, they oh, yeah. seem like a great cultural fit for us. So, yeah. And they love the campaign so much that when we, when we contracted with them, they also offered to pull in Black Women with Gardens. It's just kind of a free collaborator. So we're, we're trying to hit all these different um, demographics and people who have this demonstrated interest in that kind of self-care space, um, but are not you know, necessarily viewing flowers in that category already. And so um, we're really excited about how this is all going to roll out. It should become much more visible now um, because if you're like me, I'm not in the demographic. I won't see this on social media um, as at least in terms of paid social media, I'm seeing everybody in the industry amplifying it and pushing it out, which is great. Right, Every right. time I get on a social media feed, it's one of the first things I see, which is awesome. But now it's going to be a you know, much more organic yeah. uh, feel to it as just your everyday average consumers are exposed to all these different podcasts, and it's going to be on Spotify. You know, for if you have free Spotify, you'll have a voiceover ad running there. Um, it's on Instagram. It's on YouTube in pre-roll and mid-roll. Some are skippable. Some are not skippable. And the content the viewer sees is different based on whether they're able to skip or not. Um, and so uh, we're on Pinterest because uh, we think that's a, a major purchase activator. Yeah. Um, and so... Uh, we're kind of out there. And like wow. I said, it's going to be around 55 million consumer engagements by the time it's all said and done in just about two and a half months. Oh, my gosh. Well, this is a good timing then, that we're talking about it now, because the whole month of March, people will become more aware of the campaign. Today is the 25th of February. We're going to run this on March 4th. So by the time people see this and we're going to show them some of the of the video clips, um, they might have already seen it and wondered the backstory. So you're you're kind of bringing it all into focus. I just have to say yes. a couple of things, Steve. One is the, all of the media you're using is pretty much new media and non-traditional. So we're not talking billboards and ads in USA Today or good housekeeping. I mean, that is obviously those are major media, but a different demographic. You want to reach the what under 40 crowd or what's what's the age range? Age 25 to 35, skewing okay. more heavily towards women with a household income of 60,000 and up. That's our target. Okay. Wow. wow. But I want to I was gonna say, to I was gonna, I was gonna say, I'm your demographic, but I'm not. <laughs> I'm well, but here, here's the interesting thing is all of the the current assets that are out there, the films and the stills and all this stuff. Um, it's designed for this particular campaign. It's important to recognize the difference between the campaign and the brand. So right. the campaign is flower self-care made easy. We believe that the campaign should be refreshed every other year. So two years from now, it is our intent to be launching a brand new campaign, still under the Bat Flower Feeling banner, but no longer Flower Self-Care Made Easy. And we would then be looking at what is the next demographic that we want to access and how sure. do we want to approach that particular market? And wow. is there another category to move flowers into? And what I'd like people to do in their own mind is consider if we can show similar results in the United States as to what was successfully achieved in Europe, and we can continue to do that for in perpetuity for the next two decades or something, how significantly will we impact the cut flower industry? And I think the answer to that is it's, it's massive and unprecedented, the, the opportunities in front of us. And it's such an interesting discussion right now because pre-COVID, all of these discussions were very speculative. Like what would happen if all of a sudden consumer demand increased by 5%, by 10%, how would that impact my business and my bottom line? Now, we don't have to ask those questions anymore. We've all seen the effect on our business's bottom line. And so I would think that the, the impetus is much, much higher now because people 
as individual business owners um, have the ability to take a step back and say, this change in demand has radically changed, you know, my ability to approach this business. And so we're hoping that that really takes hold um, in terms of the psyche of the industry, because the long play here is that cow flowers will be doing everything we can over the upcoming months to organize a voluntary funding effort industry-wide. So every single participant in the industry, we would hope would step forward with funding. And with that funding, we can guarantee this successful run into the future, you know, and, and really right. make this thing go. Right. I mean, that that is the other thing I was going to say is uh, what a gift to the industry, like the explosion of people wanting to ship and wanting to join as members for Cal Flowers. Maybe I'm assuming created a lot more revenue for the organization and for the board to say, well, let's do something with this revenue to benefit the whole industry is so obvious and um but you may not be able to sustain it and that's why you want to get more support uh from other, that's exactly other right. sources because ultimately we're a trade association so when we, the board was having these discussions it mainly it, it kind of revolved around what is the single most impactful thing that we can do to benefit our members the only reason we exist is to benefit our members right and we have the fedex thing we've got the other freight programs we've got the fun and sun convention these are all tried and true and decades old and they're, they're gold standards in the industry, but we knew that we could do more with the resources that we had and changing, uh, increasing consumption in the marketplace. I can't think of a more impactful thing that could be done in the floral industry. And we weren't the only ones having this discussion. There's the floral board is having their discussion. PMA has just reorganized some of their marketing efforts. There's a lot of different things. There's the hugs and the smiles campaign. Um, and so there, there's all these different things that are happening out there. And we're hoping that, the campaign that we've launched can provide kind of a beacon to let the industry turn its focus to an effective campaign and make the decision to fund this campaign moving forward. And not just the yeah. campaign, but the brand. Really, it's the brand that we want to perpetuate and then continually launch new campaigns to move flowers into, you know, much higher in the consciousness of consumers. And um, well, yeah, so it's, it's that, awesome. that's the long play. And so we knew that um, in order to get the traction that we were looking for, the, the floral industry is absolutely full of amazing social media feeds. And so the decision was made quite early on that once we had this campaign ready to go, we were literally going to give it to everybody for free, no strings attached. And this is already the case. Um, our website, thatflowerfeeling.org, anybody can go to that website and request access um, to be able to get to the partner page on there um, and then download all these marketing assets. And once you have the marketing assets, it comes with a guide in terms of how to use them on your social media, the various different sizes and the films versus the stills and all that sort of thing. But then you actually have the, the assets at that point and you can add your own company logo to them. You can do anything you choose to do. You can create you know, bouquet wraps with the logo because all the logos are available for everybody to use. We've made everything available for everybody to use. And wow. just today, as a matter of fact, I woke up to an email from 180 Amsterdam that the second round of assets that they've been working on creating over the last three weeks has now dropped on the website. So even those who already have had access, which is almost 200 companies have requested and received access to the website and the downloadable materials, we need everybody to look back at the website now because now there's a whole new round of materials on there. And there's going to be a round three coming up as well. So, so somebody who um, uh, has a single retail flower shop um, could use this, um, just edit in their, their graphic uh, logo and a tagline or something on the last slide and push it out on Facebook and um, on their platform. And that Absolutely. Would, okay, wow. And it's we crazy. want people doing that. The more yeah. that everybody does that, the more we magnify and amplify the message and the kind of the consumer awareness. So you can use it on um, mailer campaigns, use it on uh, if there's a like a coupon program that a florist runs, you know, any anything at all, anything and everything. Wow. It's kind of a and this is a, a fun part because this is a very creative industry. It's full of uh, just the most amazing creative minds. And we're looking forward to seeing what everybody does with all these assets and, and materials and <laughs> logos and graphics and everything. It's It's all there to be had. Well, I can tell you had a lot of fun with it. Um, when you launched this in January, I joined the Zoom call and actually the very talented uh, actress, I, I mean, she's amazing, uh, jo who, who 
was your hero actress yeah. joined the call and I could tell she was so proud of the work and you showed some clips. We're going to show some clips. Tell me what your favorite one is or what the, what the one that, you know, just sp- spoke to you because they have, the theme is basically poking fun, not poking, but I guess acknowledging that we're all trying all this self-care stuff. That's exactly it. To perhaps not the desired results, I guess. Would that be fair to say? Yeah. And kind of, we wanted to demonstrate the lengths people will go to, to achieve their self-care goals. The whole idea of the campaign is to basically say, you can try all these things and, and here's how it might go. But the the easiest way, the easiest path to self-care is just go buy yourself some flowers. And that's really <laughs> the tone that we tried to adopt. And it's interesting to ask me my favorite clip because I was there for all the filming. So my favorite parts are informed by behind the scenes activities, you know, okay. where we had the most fun. Um, but the creation of the film was, it was a wild experience. I had no prior experience to anything like this at all, but we did the filming in Poland. We did it in Warsaw, Poland. And so in order to kind of set up um, the actual days of production, we had our director is Dugan O'Neill. He's from LA. We had myself and Jeannie who runs the San Francisco Flower Mart and Yost who owns and operates Floor Abundance. We were the cowflowers team that was over there. Then there was a um, our actress that you mentioned, Lexi Braverman. She's from Brooklyn. She is she was truly amazing. Amazing. Great and we're casting. planning on having her at Fun and Sun. So for those who want to meet her and, and have, have some fun, she's a very fun person. That's great. Um, she'll be there. Um, and so then we had the production company from the UK was over there. There was like four or five guys from the UK. Then we had the 180 Amsterdam team. And that, that team, there's an Australian, a Syrian, a guy from Wales, a couple of uh, Dutch folks, um, an American and another British. And then we had um, our floral stylist team is called the Wunderkammer mm-hmm. and they're German. And then the entire production crew called Tango Productions was Polish. And so we it all like there arrived are 50 in, people needed to make this thing happen. Actually on set, the, I was, this blew me away, but on set the first day, um, there were 88 people. That was the crew was 88 people to get this filming done, it's crazy. which is astounding. I did. I had literally no idea it was like this. So the first day of production, we actually uh, rented out a private home in a really upscale neighborhood just outside of Warsaw. And when we showed up at six 30 in the morning, there was trucks lined up and down the street and they'd already removed everything from inside the house, all furniture, everything. And then taped off all the entrances so there could be any damage and then replaced the interior of the house with what they wanted to see in the film. And this all happened before we even showed up. This is all before sunrise. And then the production day is like 12 to 14 hours. And it was <laughs> our great. job, the cow flowers job, because we were quote unquote, the client. We had to approve each take before they would move on to the next one. So it started out with uh, Lexi, creating the um, celery juice in the kitchen and then it moved on to the yoga scenes and then the screen therapy scene. But then the (laughs) next day was actually in a film studio. So the flower shop that's in the films, the bathroom that's in the films, um, some of the other shots, those were actually created in studio. So that flower shop, we built it from the ground up. And then we went through this very, very careful process of selecting the right flowers to show in the film because at the end of the day we wanted it to be very very broadly appealing inside the industry yeah um one of the obstacles to creating industry collaboration is if people feel that their segment or their product is underrepresented they're of course far less motivated to support that sort of campaign so um yost really kind of led point on this and he uh reached out to all these major uh flower breeders in holland um, and all these breeders came together and some wholesalers to auction, and they assembled this amazing array of flowers and then put it on trucks and ship it all over to Warsaw. And that's how we ended up with the flower selection that we had. And then we had this floral stylist team, the Wunderkammer, um, these German guys who are amazing. And so we worked with them. Every scene that you see flowers in, we were mindful of the orientation of the bouquet, how high maybe, for example, a lily or a dahlia was, because we want to make sure that we were representing just the full range of flowers. And so we didn't want to emphasize too much that might come out of, for example, uh, South America or um, East African flower farms. We wanted to make sure that uh, California and the West Coast felt like they were represented, that different greens were used. All We wanted yeah. everybody to feel part of, the, part of the game, part of the end result. And you wanted the flowers to be what U.S. consumers are going to see when they go to the flower shop or the grocery store exactly. or buy, buy at the flower farm. 
relatable and appealing and not too high cost, not exorbitant. But then creating that flower shop was a lot of fun. And I never could have dreamed how beautiful it could all come together. It um, is stunning. It does look like you were inside a flower shop and I never would have guessed it was on a set. We'll show that clip. Um, actually, that flower shop shows up in more than one of the assets, right? It does. Yeah. 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 It's it's, a, it's across several of them. I think the funniest one to me was when uh, Lexi was uh, in this like, I don't know, quilted box trying to steam herself or something. Yeah. Um, <laughs> she just yeah, really like ha- hammed it up. At home sauna. And yeah, she, but some of her takes that, that didn't make the final film were just absolutely hilarious. Oh, she, I, she's very oh. irreverent when she's filming. So she's <laughs> just dropping F-bombs and having so much fun with the script and coming up with her own wording. Um, ultimately, there was so much film material and it had to be cut down, cut down, cut down, cut down through the, the editing process. And so there was a lot of fun stuff that didn't make it, but we're very happy with the final result. And, and we had a lot yeah. of laughs behind the scenes. I can assure you that. And it maybe you'll, maybe you'll compile a blooper reel and show it at fun and sun. <laughs> it's been, it's been discussed. It's definitely been people discussed. will have to, people will have to sign an NDA, be able to watch it though. It sounds like, <laughs> um, well, that's great. Well, we'll show some of these clips. You still didn't answer my question about what your favorite one was though. Um, actually I, I like the scream therapy. I thought that uh-huh. was fun. Um, if you see a little bit longer form, you see the other actors that were brought on that are kind of on the zoom conference screen. Yes. And it was just this really cool blend of people and they were all really fun and, and funny. And the lady who the, the Polish lady who, um, was the actress that was a screen therapist, the way she looks on is just exactly the person we met. It, it was <laughs> such an interesting so to me, that was the, the funnest part. And, um, but I think that comes from my behind the scenes perspective, right. but the, the tearing off of the eyebrows is fun and the oh twisted gosh. yoga poses and the green juice and all these different things. It's, we, we had a lot of fun with it. The reason it seems like so universally relatable is that we all tried these ridiculous things during COVID. Uh, it all started with the, um, uh, you know, your sourdough starter and then went, way out of control after that. So um, it's very relatable. So congratulations. And thank you for sharing it. And I know that there are, I mean, even, even when I first heard about this, my first reaction was, well, you know, through the slow flowers lens, well, this is just promoting flowers. It's not going to promote domestic flowers, but the truth is the asset is so fantastic. And so, so universal about flower, the role we want flowers to play in people's lives. There's, there's no reason why somebody who's growing domestic flowers or selling domestic flowers can't piggyback on that for their own branding and, and absolutely educate their customers in a new way. And I, I really, I think that's incredibly uh, beneficial for everybody and we all want to get behind it. Yeah. And it's a really important point that you make um, because the cow flowers position is if we create X percent market expansion, it's going to affect everybody, the people who, transport the flowers, you know, who import flowers, who grow demand, it should affect everybody in an egalitarian way. Um, yeah. But at the same time, cow flowers is very motivated to support all these other different, you know, efforts inside the industry, slow flowers being a fantastic example. That's part of our, our model and our, and our aspirations is to really support. So we do a lot of industry funding for things like um, state floral association, educational programs, trying to get high school kids, you know, mm. thinking about careers in floral. Um, That's great. Our support for slow flowers, you know, the, the whole domestic and local vor and that sort of concept. We love that stuff. Right? It's it's fantastic. Um, and also, you know, things like uh, WUFSA, the Wholesale Florist Association, where we always support everything they do. SAF, we support them. AIFD, you know, we're always platinum sponsors for them. So we just recognize that we're a very dynamic industry with a lot of moving parts and the better all the moving parts are working together, the better off we're all going to be. And so we take a very neutral position on most every issue and just choose <laughs> the fun, what we think are in alignment with our, with our mission. And so um, yeah, fun that's and kind sun. of historically where we're at. Yeah. Fun and sun. And that, uh, you know, for what is the, the campaign of floral self-care flowers, self-care made easy. Flower self-care made it easy. Like you are going to be the guys who have the fun, the most fun in, in this business. So we want to be in the, we want to be in the room with you. <laughs> okay. So I'm going to show a few of the clips uh, edited into this interview. And um, also just 
encourage people to start reposting and sharing when you see it on whatever platform you're on. You could repost any of the Pinterest things onto your Pinterest page. You Mm -hmm. could um, take the videos if you see it on YouTube and repost it or post your own. Um, And then what are the... uh, what are the other main, we're hearing it on podcasts, we're hearing it on, um, uh, through influencers, but did you say also that there's going to be like a TikTok thing? I, I didn't, I don't know. There, if there are some of our, inf- about half our influencers are huge on TikTok. Okay. So, so all they the influencers would be that we've selected to have at least 400,000 followers, at least some of them are in the several million range. Um, and so we knew TikTok is, is interesting because the, the various marketing agencies that we work with, have not quite figured TikTok out yet. And so originally we were going with the more tried and true, yeah. you know, established um, digital media patterns that a lot of their, you know, marketing uh, entities were following. But TikTok is just skyrocketing um, in terms of its usage and popularity. And it has its own style. I, I had to download TikTok myself just a few weeks ago. I'd never seen anything on TikTok. But all of a sudden we're hiring influencers. I was like, I got to figure out who these people are. And <laughs> right. You know, at at the end of the day, um, I'm not the target audience. So I had to be really mindful of putting myself in the shoes of the the consumers we want to appeal to when settling on the final influencer list. But we're really excited with the list that we've got put together. Um, We're hitting just so many different demographics and lifestyles. uh, And and that's that's where we want to be. We want it to be a very, very diverse and, and exciting campaign across all different cultural segments. That's fantastic. And you're right. Everybody needs flowers. So let's let's be as inclusive and, you know, far reaching as possible uh, to get the word out. Yeah. And there oh is gosh. one other aspect of the campaign I want to mention. Um, yeah. This is a, a good example of the type of things that are going on in the background of the campaign that are not always the easiest to communicate and for people to sense what's going on. But we have a, uh, a contract with 180 New York. So this is a sister company to Amsterdam. They have about six offices around the world, but we're working with Amsterdam on the creative and the production, but we're working with New York on social media management. And what that okay. means is that they now have a team that they started this week and they're doing what's called active listening across social media. So what they're doing is they're, they're crunching data. They have a couple data analysts um, on site that tracks things that are trending and that sort of thing. And they're watching celebrity posts about self-care and all these different things. And they're out there actively engaging with celebrities, with individual consumers, all these different areas on social media. And they're watching for sparks and we're, we're continually watching for little sparks. And when you get a little cultural spark going, then they try and fan it into a bonfire. And we're trying to see if the opportunity exists to push things to go viral. So a good example of that, and some people may have Come across. I definitely was aware of this when it happened, not knowing what about uh, what the background was. But this New York team at Thanksgiving, some woman in America had sent this tweet out about how awful Marie Callender's pies are because hers was absolutely torched coming out of the oven. And then it turns out she baked it for an hour longer than she had to. So <laughs> the one in the New York team has the account for Marie Callender's. So they were like, OK, that's a spark right there. So what they did is they came back as Marie Callender's. They responded directly to this tweet as Marie Callender's <clears throat> and said, hey, um, we realized that the you know pie baking experience didn't go exactly as you planned, but we really appreciate your support you know, of the brand and the effort you put into it. So we'd like to invite you to help us create a new pie recipe. And so this whole thing just exploded in social media. And the, this conversation had 17 million views in the first 24 hours. And that's what we mean by going from spark yeah. to bonfire. And there's no guarantee this is going to happen. Right. But it's the type of thing that we're doing. Another thing you see on TikTok a lot is these side by sides, where it's a TikTok of somebody reviewing another TikTok and kind of their facial expressions yes. and how they react yeah. to it. Yeah. Yeah. And we're in the process of deciding whether that's a potential uh, channel for us as well. So there's a lot of different aspects that we're working on. And then the other thing is uh, we we contracted a company called Lucid, and so. If any of you are ever kind of online and you get these solicitations to go to these survey websites, you can get airline miles or hotel points or whatever, whatever they do to to motivate you to take these online surveys, we have one that's gone live today. And the way it works is the survey site knows if you've been exposed to campaign or not um, through something called pixels. And if you, and this creates two groups, it creates a test group and a control group. So the test group has seen the campaign, the control group hasn't. And then they all receive the same sequence of questions. And once we have the data in, which would be about the third week of April, 
will be able to go side by side and say, if they saw the campaign, this is their intent to purchase in the next weeks or months, or this is how they feel about flowers. They do think it belongs in self-care space. And then we can put that against those who never saw the campaign. And that is our effort to demonstrate to the industry that it worked. That's the, the closest we can come because ultimately um, tracking actual purchasing statistics is very difficult. It's next to impossible. So, but, but that's so interesting. Like you're trying to have the metrics and the measure uh, to demonstrate that you're moving the needle. Exactly. As, in at least in the ways that you can track it. And like you said, it is, I mean, the industry is so large and not everyone reports and like, how do you actually know? So I'm, I'm impressed with that. That's great. Yeah. And this is how, and once we have that data, that's when we get into our final push to uh, really engage with the industry at all levels, whether that be, you know, major grocery corporations to uh, the airlines that transport flowers into the United States, uh, plant breeders around the world, um, domestic flower farmers, retail florists, um, you name it. We're going to be yeah. looking for everybody to contribute at a level that they're comfortable with. It makes sense for them. That's within their market, their existing marketing budget to allocate some of those funds toward cow flowers. And if we hit the annual um, funding goals, then we will run this campaign year round. We'll get it and into more channels. We'll move it into the out of home space. You earlier mentioned things like billboards. Yeah. That's what in the world of marketing is called out of home. Okay. Um, so billboards and metro stations and all these different things, but also flower installations and create uh, one idea that was discussed that's still on the back burner is to have this moving kind of a flower hotel concept where you go into these swanky parts of various major urban centers and you find an empty space and you hire a bunch of local designers and just absolutely smother the thing with flowers top to bottom. And then invite people in for Instagramable moments and yeah. let let that take off and, and burn. And so there's all these different things we can do, but we do require industry funding. We've taken as far as we can go on our own set of resources. You know, we spent uh, several million dollars uh, to date on the campaign and, and then the execution, the digital media side. And so um, there's a limit to what Cal Flowers can do on our own. But I think if the industry agrees and turns its focus towards this, the sky's the limit on this. So wow. we can really make it go. And then who knows, two years from now, we may be, launching an entirely new campaign you kind of let the original one rest but it's still under that flower feeling banner yeah so the yeah. consumer brand itself begins to grow and grow and grow and then if if retail florists all over the country and farmers markets and everybody else they adopt that flower feeling and all of a sudden that logo is appearing on their goods that are being sold to consumers that continues to reinforce it and we can really lift this thing up and make it go forward in the future that's yeah. our that's our goal wow Okay, well, I wanted to ask you about yourself and your path to flowers, but so before we wrap up, can you just give us a little background on what, how you fell down this rabbit hole and this? Yeah, path? so <laughs> I, I guess I was kind of an, I was an accidental participant in the flower industry. Um, You're definitely enthusiastic, Steve. <laughs> I am. I, it's, uh, I love, the, I love the flower business. It's been very, very good to me and my family and some of my closest friends in the industry. And it's been amazing. Um I wouldn't change a thing, but I graduated from University of San Diego in, um, I guess it'd be 93. And I had a degree, a degree in psychology. My intent was to go to graduate school and become a clinical psychologist. And in order to get the funding I needed to accomplish that goal, I went to work in my parents' business, which is called United Floral Exchange. It was, it was a floral broker based in Denver that basically served retail florists all over the country. So we had about maybe at that time, 350 customers all over the country. We were one of the very few kind of one of the earliest direct shippers of flowers out of California, you know, into um, retail florists, you know, around the country. Some was by truck, some was by FedEx, some was by air, but um, that was my uh, introduction to business and I loved it. And so I, I actually gave up my dream of graduate school and decided I'm going to sink my teeth into this because this is fun and I love the people I'm interacting with and I love the product and I was learning so much. And so then a few years later, uh, we won the SAF Marketer of the Year Award for a program called Tour de Fleur. And <clears throat> excuse me, some of your local farms will get a kick out of this. The way the Tour de Fleur was organized, it was a summertime program. And all of our florists that signed up for it, it was usually about 100 to 150 customers. They would receive a mixed box from a different flower farm every week. And it was a 12-week program. And so we were shipping flowers out of Wisconsin and Michigan and Indiana and Washington State. And, you know, some were heavy on branches and blossoms. Some were... You know, we we hit the full range. The idea is to make it very novelty and very fun. And this was a time when a lot of wholesale florists were not carrying this type of inventory. It's changed a lot. Now, 
wholesale florists, th that program no longer has a, a, a need in, in the floral industry because now wholesale florists, you know, do an amazing job of accessing all these products and making them available to retailers. Back then it was quite different. So that was a fun program that we, we won some awards That's for that. Amazing. Like it, what better way to get this product into the hands of florists so that they then start asking <clears throat> for more and trying different regions and different varieties. I love that. I would Yeah. And it really helped that. a lot of small local farms with, yeah. with some really unique and cool products to get their product out there. And it created new relationships where all of a sudden these retail florists wanted to buy year round from these farms um, through United Floral Exchange. So yeah. <laughs> yeah. You was, had to, you had to be the distributor there. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, exactly. So um, then we uh, opened a division to produce bouquets in Southern California. And then we eventually moved the Denver office out to California. So I kind of had my return back to San Diego. And then a few years down the road, uh, my parents sold the company to USA Bouquet, which at that time was, maybe the largest flower company in North America. And they were based out of Miami. And so I took a three-year contract to work with them and help integrate the companies together and establish them with their West Coast buying uh, for their bouquet making operations all over the country. Um, and then when I hit the end of that contract, I kind of left that situation and I was trying to decide um, what to do next. And I, I had this uh, really strong uh, friendship with Wayfex Australia, with Craig Musson, and Adrian Parsons at Wayfex Australia. We'd known each other for about 10, 12, 15 years at that point. And so I reached out to them based on the understanding that there was a, I didn't feel any companies were doing a really good job of specializing in Australian and South African natively grown cut flowers. Mm -hmm. And I felt there was a huge opportunity for that. So I started Wayfex USA in partnership with them. And I spent a great deal of time traveling the world. Um, and with, with Craig, <clears throat> and to a lesser extent, Adrian, and we identified all these little climate pockets around the world where all, you know, that our specialty flowers could be grown. This is mainly like proteas, pin cushions, wax flower, uh, brunia, brazilias, things in that kind of product range. And Love so it. It, it took me all over the world. I've, I've been on every continent at least three times, except the, the cold one down <laughs> south. And uh, you know, over the last 10 years and met a ton of flower farmers all over the place and created the most amazing bonds and, and friendships and we have several exclusive programs, you know, under Wayfex USA that we feel we're kind of best in class in certain product categories. Um, so that's kind of been my path. I, yeah. I handed over management of Wayfex. I'm no longer involved in day-to-day -day operations at all. My team handles the, the company operations completely, and I'm fully focused on Calflowers as the executive director and absolutely loving it. It's, getting this, um, this position has, has been a lot like um, being hired by your own peers, yeah. To just go do, you know, awesome stuff. Yeah. And yeah. that's essentially how it's been. And I, I'm, I have a tremendous amount of gratitude towards the Cal Flowers Board for um, entrusting me with this position and this major project that we've all worked so closely on together. And uh, we're very, very happy with where we're at right now. The results seem really good and the association is strong and our members seem really happy with what we're doing. Well, you brought this energy to this position, which you've had, you, you basically started this job like right before COVID, right? As I recall. Actually, I started in November of 2020. So we were oh, pretty far we're in by that time. Yeah. yeah, pretty far in by that time. <laughs> but you had been on the board. So you knew a lot of the issues and, and you'd been involved in some of the leadership. I'd been on the board for almost 20 years and I'd served as president twice. So very, very familiar with the association. And I've wow. been just a huge fan of Cal Flowers and what we do. We're pretty quiet in terms of the yeah. world of associations, but yeah. we're very proud of what we're involved in. And we support things at a very kind of organic and granular level throughout the industry. Um, we know that we're, we're a really important part of a lot of different educational programs and, and things like that, that we think are just absolutely essential to making the industry strong. And so I've always just uh, had a, just a warm and fuzzy feeling about what we do as a board. And then to be entrusted with the, the executive director position was just a real, real boost for me. And I, I've really come with a lot of enthusiasm and I'm, very, very proud and happy to be part of, of the Cal Flowers family. Oh my God. The momentum is crazy. And um, I think that this campaign is going to be one that uh, is taught in uh, marketing and MBA classes going forward and also just so. change the industry. Yeah. Uh, I will say, I think that psychology degree is probably helping a little bit. You know, you, you understand how to work with people and that that's a skill. Yeah, uh, but my you know. son is uh, in college and he just switched over to psychology. <laughs> and uh, I told him, I said, you know what? It's it's a it's an abstract science, but it can be a very very effective tool to to lean back on over your lifespan once you understand the way the mind works and 
cognitive biases and differences in perception and cultural differences and things like that and how it informs our decision making it it really is a nice uh nice tool to have in your in your toolkit that's for sure oh my gosh Oh, Steve, this has been so great. I'm really revved up to share the videos. We'll edit some of them into this uh, episode and try to get as many of the Soul Flowers community and our audience to check this out and amplify it because that's the multiplier you talked about is um, the reshares and the um, repost is really what's going to push this out to audiences. Yeah, and we need everybody to help. And it's, yeah. it's unorthodox because we're literally telling you take all the assets for free and use them as much as you want in as many different ways as you want. It's a very, very unorthodox approach yeah, to marketing, but we mean it. it. All you need is access to download off the website, um, which people can email me directly for that um, at steve at cafgs.org. Um, and I will uh, configure your account inside the website. You download assets, um, join several hundred of your fellow industry stakeholders and push them out there and have fun with it and come up with new ideas and share them back with us. Let us know what you're doing. I love it. I can't wait to see what goes viral and becomes a bonfire. <laughs> it kind of makes, yeah, me, very wonder. About that part. Yeah. <laughs> it makes me wonder who's going to try to, uh, you know, like manufacture some kind of viral moment, but I, I hope it's organic. And uh, how cool is that? Thanks so much. Uh, we will talk soon and uh, we'll see you on um, every platform possible. So um, thank you for Excellent. bringing this to our conversation today. Yeah. And uh, thanks so much for, for featuring Cal Flowers, Deborah. We really, really appreciate it. And like I said before, we very much value our association with Slow Flowers. We're very proud of what you guys are doing out there. So keep up the great work. We'll keep doing our part. You keep doing your part. And together, let's make the industry a better place. That's great. And I, I'm sure I'll see you at Fun and Sun. So uh, Absolutely. Okay. Thanks a lot, Steve. Okay. Thanks again, Deborah. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thanks so much for joining us today. As Steve has been encouraging us, we should all want everyone to experience the impact of flowers on a daily basis. The Slow Flowers community already knows that flowers are a beautiful, natural dose of feel-good. That experience shouldn't just be reserved for special occasions. And we know that even the most modest bouquet of flowers can have all sorts of positive short- and long-term effects on how people feel. In other words, it's that flower feeling. As I said, you can visit our show notes for episode 548 at slowflowerspodcast.com to watch the replay video of today's interview, as well as find links and more resources to participate as a partner in that flower feeling and use it for your own marketing. Well, what a difference one week makes. If you're a regular Slow Flowers podcast listener, you remember that last week's guests were Adam and Jennifer O'Neill of Pepper Harrow Farm. Just last Friday, their beautiful property and all of the farm buildings and structures on their property were destroyed when a tornado raced through a swath of Madison County, Iowa, across their flower farm. I've been working closely with Jennifer and Adam for the past year as our sister company, Bloom Imprint, is publishing their first book, Small Farm, Big Dreams. The book is scheduled to go to the printer in just a few weeks, so we don't have any announcements just yet, but I expect to soon be able to share ways you can support them, either through donations or a book purchase. For now, we're sending our heartfelt best wishes to the O'Neills and Pepper Harrow Farm. We're grateful that their lives and residents were spared, and yet we can't imagine how devastating it is for them to face rebuilding more than a decade of hard work and all their resources to establish a very successful and special place. You can find links to follow Pepper Haro in today's show notes. And as I mentioned, I'll share more in the coming weeks. Our next sponsor thanks goes to the Association of Specialty Cut Flower Growers. Formed in 1988, ASCFG was created to educate, unite, and support commercial cut flower growers. Its mission is to help growers produce high-quality floral material and to foster and promote the local availability of that product. Learn more at ASCFG.org. Coming up this Friday, March 11th at 9 a.m. Pacific and noon Eastern, you're invited to join our March Slow Flowers member meetup. Our special guest is author Teresa Spate and many of the creatives featured in her beautiful new book, 
Black Flora. This is a significant new title in the floral marketplace. This event is open to guests, so be sure to share the link with anyone in flower farming and floral design who should know about Black Flora. We'll discuss the book, meet several of the flower farmers and floral designers who participated, and preview the stunning cover floral art by Nicole Cordier. And we'll see some of the interior spreads. We're opening up this month's meetup to guests, as I said, but everyone needs to pre-register. You can find the link to pre-register in our show notes for episode 548 at slowflowerspodcast.com. I hope to see you in the Zoom room. Our final sponsor thanks goes to Red Twig Farms. Based in Johnstown, Ohio, Red Twig Farms is a family-owned farm specializing in peonies, daffodils, tulips, and branches. A popular peony bouquet by mail program and their Spread the Hope campaign where customers purchase 10 tulip stems for essential workers and others in their community. Learn more at redtwigfarms.com. Thanks so much for joining us today. The Slow Flowers podcast is a member-supported endeavor downloaded more than 821,000 times by listeners like you. Thank you for listening, commenting, and sharing. It means so much. As our movement gains more supporters and more passionate participants who believe in the importance of our domestic cut flower industry, the momentum is contagious. I know you feel it too. If you're new to our weekly show or our long-running podcast, check out all of our resources at slowflowerssociety.com. Consider joining us or making a donation to sustain Slow Flowers' ongoing advocacy, education, and outreach activities. You can find the donate button in the column to the right at slowflowerspodcast.com. I'm Deborah Prinzing, host and producer of the Slow Flowers show and podcast. The Slow Flowers podcast is engineered and edited by Andrew Brenlin. The content and opinions expressed here are either mine alone or those of my guests alone, independent of any podcast sponsor or other person, company, or organization. Next week, you're invited to join me in putting more slow flowers on the table, one stem, one base at a time. Thanks so much for joining us today, and I'll see you next week. Thank you.